So there is a discussion with regards to is it recommended for Muslims learned or lay to wear the clothes of Muslims from other countries, whether it is the Muslims who live in the Middle East, North Africa, the Far East, Malaysia, Indonesia, Nigeria, Ghana, Gambia, Ivory Coast, uh, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, etc. Or should you just wear pants and a shirt, a three-piece suit, a button-up, you know, shorts, baseball cap, and just fit in with the rest of the uh, Americans that are non-Muslim or British or Canadians? Is it recommended not to stick out and not to be identified, uh, even if the clothing isn't Islamic, Sunnah, but it's Muslim clothing for sure, you shouldn't dress like that. Rather, you should just dress with a, a suit and a tie. You should wear, you know, a, a jacket and, you know, just be a normal American. Versus uh, a learned person, a caller to Allah, wearing the clothing of the Muslims. I would say one of the things that helps us to determine what's correct, what's best. Some of my personal life experiences, places, hotels, airplanes, trains, airports, train stations, in which you're sitting there minding your business and a non-Muslim walks up to you and says, you look very nice today. Or a non-Muslim walking up to you and saying, how do you stay so clean and white? You're traveling, you have kids with you, but I don't see not one single stain on you. Or a non-Muslim walking up to you and says, excuse me, are you a Muslim? How can I become a Muslim? My brother's a Muslim, but I never heard of such and such and such and such. Well, Allah, I could tell you story after story. Places in which you dress like a Muslim and the non-Muslim engages you with the dawah opportunities. So if I was just wearing, you know, some khakis, some slacks, a button-up shirt, a baseball cap, those non-Muslims wouldn't know that I'm a Muslim. And they wouldn't walk up to me and approach me. And there would be a loss of dawah opportunity and proper representation of Islam. Hopefully the point is proven, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. Khayr and inshallah ta'ala, as far as the ruling on wearing kuhul, or uh, as some cultures they call it kajal, or some type of eye mascara, then obviously um, it suits a double purpose, and that is medicinal, health benefits, and also zina, uh, beautification and adornment. Okay, beautification and adornment, right? Is it sunnah to wear kuhul? Or is it something which is from sunnah to al-adah? It's something that the Prophet ﷺ uh, done, uh, he did or may have done, the Sahaba did, it was known, and it is necessarily a spiritual reward connected to it, like a turban. Now, I'm, what's important is that there are benefits in placing that upon one's eyes or one's eyelashes. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Moving forward to the next chapter. The author may all hide his faults. He says, the student of knowledge has to be mindful of his, her appearance. Hadith 29, narrated Bara bin Azib radiallahu anhu, kan nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marbu'an ba'ida ma bayna al-mankibayni lahu sha'run yablughu shahmata udhunayhi ra'aytuhu fi hullatin hamra'a lam ara shay'an qattu ahsana minhu. The Prophet ﷺ was of moderate height, having broad shoulders and long hair reaching his earlobes. Once I saw him in a red cloak, and I had never seen a more handsome person than him. Another variation of this hadith states, إِلَى مَنْ كِبَيْهِ To his shoulders. This hadith can be found in the Jami' of Imam al-Bukhari. Once again, we see the cohesive nature of the book. And one chapter complements and goes along with another chapter. Wearing white, and if you don't wear white or you wear other colors, even when you do wear white, look nice. Make sure your clothes are ironed and not wrinkled, not spotted or stained or dirty or holy. Don't look shabby if you're a talib al-ilm because you're an ambassador, you're a representative, a delegate of the deen of ilm, of sunnah. And you want to cut off as many excuses as possible for those to reject your message. 
or to find an excuse to accept your message. Now, somebody may want to listen to your message, but say he's dirty, he doesn't look nice, or if I become a Muslim, or if I start studying knowledge, I'm already a Muslim, that means I can't look nice, I can't have expensive things, or nice things, or name brands, or I, I can't you know, look after my appearance, I can't be pretty, etc. And it doesn't mean that. And just because a person looks nice and takes care of his appearance doesn't mean that a man is to be feminine, emasculated, or as we say, uh, bougie or bourgeoisie, even though it's lawful for a man to be, quote unquote, bougie or bourgeoisie. It's lawful to have nice things and to look nice and to be dapper. There's, there's a hadith regarding that. But the concept that a man takes it to the extreme in which he's in the mirror as long, if not longer, than a woman. That, that's obviously another extreme. Now, what's important is to look nice doesn't mean that you have to have expensive things or name brand things. That doesn't, that's not the meaning of looking nice and looking presentable. Being clean doesn't have to be fancy or expensive. Now, and the same applies to your hair, your hairstyle, trimming your mustache, so on and so forth. Your feet, your uh, uh, footwear, and the list goes on. And the hikmah behind looking nice and looking or having a good appearance is that you represent the deen and you represent da'wah. Khair, inshallah ta'ala. And also, people, they may even admire your style, which could also be another uh, type or, or means of leverage in your da'wah when someone respects you and they admire you. So that's what's meant by the chapter heading. Hadith number 29 clearly states that Bara bin Azib, anhu, he saw the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wearing a red cloak. And he says, Lama ara shay'an qattu. I never saw someone or man more handsome than that. Proving that the Prophet was handsome and beautiful, and we should follow him in that example. Now, here on page 64, the hadith says, So this is a, uh, a mistake here, and that diacritical mark, the vowel sound on the shadda of the ya should be with the dhamma. And it should say, so inshallah ta'ala, if you have it in your book, highlight it. And we'll try our best in the next print to fix that error and to fix that mistake. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. This hadith also shows, or it's also an evidence and a proof for those who say that it's lawful for men to wear the color red. And the scholars of Islam, they differ on that issue. Is it lawful? Is it haram? Is it makru to wear red? This hadith would obviously support those who say that it's lawful to wear red. And this hadith also shows the permissibility for men to have long hair. And just because he has long hair does not mean or necessitate that he's imitating a woman. How long can his hair be? Can it be longer than one's shoulders? Or after the shoulders is imitating a woman? That's a further discussion and he's further proof and evidence. Wallahu ta'ala alam. The next chapter, we're uh, moving away from the discussion of clothing and appearance. And also... The do's and don'ts with the teacher, with the student, etc. But now we're getting into some technicalities of talabul in. The author, may Allah forgive him, he says, memorizing and reviewing the glorious Quran. Hadith number 30 is narrated Abdullah Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu. The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, Bit samali ahadihim yaqudu nusitu ayata kayta wa kayta, bal huwa nusi, istavkirul Qur'ana. How wretched is one of them who says, I have forgotten such and such a verse. Rather, he has been caused to forget. Try to remember the Quran. For it is more inclined to escape from the hearts of men than camels from their ropes. This hadith has been collected by Imam Muslim. Memorizing and reviewing the glorious Quran, i.e. the obligation of doing so for a student of knowledge, the importance and the virtue of doing so, and how the Quran is the foundation of all knowledge and all science. You master it, mastery of the other sciences will be relatively easy. That's a fact. You're sloppy in this, you'll be sloppy in the other sciences as well. So memorizing the whole Qur'an, if possible, and if not a good portion from it, and if not enough to suffice you in your salah, and enough to suffice you in your class, and if and when you need to do a class or a khutbah, you know what to quote and what to reference, and if you need to write a book, 
or you're having a debate or whatever, you know where to find the information. Being very familiar with the Quran if you haven't memorized it by heart. And even if you've memorized the Quran by heart, it doesn't mean that you're that sharp to quote it and to pull it immediately when you need it. Many people say they memorize the Quran, but they can't quote it when they need it, when speaking or talking. So the more time you give the Quran, the more time you spend with the Quran, the better your Islam will be. The better you're a Muslim you'll be, let alone uh, the better of a student of knowledge. And we've explained this before with regards to the Hadith of Uthman and Volume 1, Khayrukum man ta'allam al Qur'ana wa alamahu. In this Hadith, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud narrates that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that the Qur'an, it is ashaddu tafassiyan, tafallutan. The Qur'an will go away, it will leave you faster than an untied camel leaves. Clearly showing and proving is that you have to lock it down, review it, review it, study, go over it, over and over and over and over again. And if you don't, you will lose your edge. Right? Khairan, inshallah. That's a highlighting point from the hadith, a warning the student of knowledge from neglecting the Quran, its recitation, its memorization, its review. Huh? Khairan, inshallah. This hadith also goes to show is that from the etiquette of the Quran or with the Quran is not to say, I've forgotten. But to say, Bel Nusia, you have been made to forget. Shaitan made you forget. Someone and something made you forget. Don't say that I have forgotten. That is an unbefitting statement with regards to the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This hadith also goes to show the permissibility and the recommendation of using examples and parables and metaphors when speaking about things. Many people, unfortunately, they think and they feel that a person is attributing a law to uh, resembling his created beings. The Prophet ﷺ says, Indeed, you will see your Lord as you see the full moon in the sky. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ is not, he's not comparing Allah to the moon. He's not cons comparing the face of Allah to the moon, but he's, con he's comparing the ru'ya, seeing, the clarity of the ru'ya. Here, the speech of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ is not comparing the Qur'an to a camel, but he's comparing the escape the leaving, a person being caused to forget it is faster than that of wahakada. Naam? And that's clear as day. And this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Khair inshallah. And the lesson from that uh, is pretty obvious and pretty plain. Next chapter, the author, may Allah help him. He says, Mastery of the Sciences of Hadith. Narrated Abdul Malik ibn Sa'id ibn Suwaid from Abu Humaid. And Abu Usaid radiallahu anhuma, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا سَمِعْتُمُ الْحَدِيثَ عَنِّي تَعْرِفُهُ قُلُوبُكُمْ وَتَلِينُ لَهُ أَشْعَارُكُمْ وَأَبْشَارُكُمْ وَتَرَوْنَ أَنَّهُ مِنْكُمْ قَرِيبٌ فَأَنَا أَوْلَاكُمْ بِهِ وَإِذَا سَمِعْتُمُ الْحَدِيثَ عَنِّي تُنْكِرُهُ قُلُوبُكُمْ وَتَنْفِرُ أَشْعَارُكُمْ وَأَبْشَارُكُمْ وَتَرَوْنَ أَنَّهُ مِنْكُمْ بَعِيدٌ فَأَنَا أَبْعَدُكُمْ مِنْ when you hear a hadith being attributed to me, what your hearts recognize, and what you hear and skin become tender, and you feel that it is near to you, know that I am nearer to it than you. And when you hear a hadith being attributed to me, of which your hearts disapprove, from which your hair and skin recoil, and you feel that it is far from you, know that I am even farther from it than you. And this hadith can be found in the Musnad of Ahmed. Mastery of the Sciences of Hadith for those who want to specialize in hadith, it being obligatory. And it being recommended for those who don't specialize in hadith. And what's meant by mastering the sciences of hadith is becoming an expert. Using your natural talent and gaining skill and skill sets and becoming an expert in ilmul hadith. And the memorization of the narrations, the chains of narrations, the mutun, knowing the authentic from the inauthentic, the fabricated from the weak, naam, Knowing the weak hadiths that have sound meanings versus the weak hadiths that have uh, rejected meanings. Knowing the books of hadith, the history of hadith conservation, Naam? the liars, the fabricators, the signs and the details of the clues of hadith fabrication, etc. Knowing the fiqh of the hadith, the ahkam of the hadith, knowing the masail that are taken from the hadiths, and the comparative fiqh and the madahib, the madahib. knowing how to use hadith to give a reminder, a mo'idha, an admonition, exhortation, a khutbah, a class, a speech, a lecture, a book. Understanding how to translate the hadiths 
and how to get the message and the spirit of the hadith and the sunnah to the people, to the common people, to the non-Muslims, mastering the sciences of hadith. And of course, this in itself, a book can be written on it. A lecture, lectures can be given on the importance, the need, and the necessity and the advantage of mastering Ilm al-Hadith. And as we have said many times before, a person can become unstoppable in dawah and fiqh, any field he's pursuing, any opponent that he has, if he's mastered Ilm al-Hadith. And that's a fact. Speaking to the non-Muslims, those who call themselves Christians, those who claim to love Christ and to have passion, okay, Ilm al-Hadith automatically gives you the cutting edge. Among the different groups of Muslims, and the different aqidahs, the different fiqh and madhabs, knowing Ilm al-Hadith can give you the cutting edge above and beyond them just by knowing the sunnah in and out and how most issues are based off of the hadiths and how we know our Prophet Sallallahu uh, for argument's sake because Isa is our Prophet as well. He's a, he's a Nabi that we believe in and love as well. There's no doubt about that. And we believe in his message, his original pure message as well. Naam. And the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, came to confirm the message of Isa and those previous prophets and messengers as well. But for argument's sake, there's someone arguing with you and they claim to be Christian. Why do we have to be Muslims? Islam isn't this. Muhammad isn't that, etc., etc. You can just ask some basic questions. Tell me about Christ. Give me the description of Christ. Tell me what, what shoes did he wear? What clothes did he wear? What color did he like? What food did he eat? But scientifically, authentically, accurately prove to me these things. They won't be able to. The most educated Christian won't be able to. So this is an example of how the sunnah gives you leverage, gives you, as we said, the cutting edge in any field of discussion. Naam. Khair and inshallah ta'ala. So that's a long discussion. Uh, many other books we've uh, explained regarding ilm al-hadith and the different types of ilm al-hadith. And how Ilm al-Hadith isn't just Mustalah al-Hadith, Hadith terminology, Sahih Hasan Daif. It's deeper than that. The fiqh of the Sunnah, the fiqh of the Hadith, the tarikh of the Hadith, the isnaz of the Hadith, etc. Naam. So we have the Hadith here from um, Abu Humaid and Abu Usaid. May Allah be pleased with them both. That the Messenger of Allah basically, basically said when you hear Hadith that you feel comfortable with, it, it touches your heart. It doesn't bother you or prick you or, or rub you the wrong way, but you feel this oh, This is a beautiful narration. And it is familiar to your hearts and your minds and the style that the Prophet would speak and how he would talk about Jannah and Jahannam and, and Hasanat and Sayyat and peoples and this and that, rewards and punishments, describing Allah, the Adhkar, the supplications, the prayer, kindness, mercy, humanity, right? Humane nature, dealing with the enemy, etc. Know for sure that I have said it. In other words, the one who masters Ibn Hadith, he has all of the technicalities and through uh, abundant or long experience, he grows or he obtains a malaka, if you want to call a sixth sense. He gets a, 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 a taste and a touch for it. As a scholar of Hadith would mention, like a jeweler, a goldsmith, he can pick up the coin, he can flip it and say it's fake, it's counterfeit. Even to this very day, people who deal with money at the money exchange, you give them the, the, the money, the exchange, they'll know this is fake. Get out of here. What do you mean it's fake? Bro, it's fake. Trust me. But how do you know? I know. I felt it. Because he's been touching money and bills for how many years? He's been taught and trained. He has the natural knack, the natural talent, and pure experience. And the same applies to gold, a watch, diamonds. A person says, this is fake. Cubic zirconia. This, is, this isn't real. Just by looking at it, there's a sparkle. It's that's fugazi, as we say. It isn't real. It's not authentic. All right? And this is obviously isn't something that a person wakes up with or is born with. But this is based off of, as we said, talent. And it's based off of years and years and years of in-depth study and training and reading and research. And then a person is blessed by Allah so a to have that. As many of the ulama of hadith would say, ma'arifu hadithi ilham. Divinely guided inspiration. Khayran, inshallah, that's a long, 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 long discussion. And the same applies to the hadith, which, quote unquote, doesn't make sense. Meaning, since in light of Islam and the facts of history, etc., etc., a hadith which goes against the, the, the sound aqad, the sound mind, that goes against historical proof, and there's no valid interpretation for it. 
the hadith which goes against the clear cut teachings of Islam, of Quran and Hadith. Um, and the Isnads is already, sh they're already shaky or no Isnad. Let alone if, that, if it was a pure, clean Isnad, but the metan is munkar. And this is from Ibn Hadith. The Prophet is telling the Sahaba, then not only is it, it's not from you, but I have nothing to do with this narration, even more than you have nothing to do with it. That is false, it's fabricated, and it's spurious. And in the Hadith, uh, there are many different genres, as we have explained, and we've tried to give a lot of effort to bring to the surface, to show all of the Muslims that it's a world in itself, and there are different levels, different chambers of Ibn al-Hadith that a person is to spend his years, if he wants to, learning them, becoming a novice, becoming a proficient, becoming a scholar, becoming a master in those uloom. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. والحمد لله رب العالمين